What's going on everybody? It's your boy Greg Peters, Miata Dad, and today inside the VVT studio we have the VVT Beast. What do you have to say for yourself there, Beast? It's a little quiet today, and for good reason, because the engine is taken apart. Now I know some of you guys that follow my videos are probably a little bit confused because I just talked about having to replace my transmission, which is still a thing, but another little issue that's developed over the last few weeks as we're creeping into winter and it's getting a little colder is the car kind of runs on three cylinders in the morning, and that's annoying. So after doing the normal things, changing the spark plugs, swapping around the ignition coils to see if you know the dead cylinder would move from one to another, I hit up my buddy Toby at Advanced Engine Dynamics, and he said, you know what? Brand new valve train, the engine's got 11,000 miles on it now, you might want to check your lash just to see if everything's within spec. So that's what this video will be teaching you guys how to do today. Now if your car starts in the morning and runs on three cylinders, this might be your issue. Or if you have a loud ticking, that might also be your issue as your lash might be too big. Now, do not get that confused with the ticking issue on the earlier Miatas. What I'm going to show you in this video today has nothing to do with 1990 to 1997 Miata engines. Those have hydraulic lash adjusters and this procedure is completely unnecessary, pointless and won't do anything. But if you have a 99 to 2005 Miata engine, this video is for you. And this general process can be used on any engine with solid lifters, whether it's a shim type like the Miata or whether it has adjustable rockers like older BMWs and Hondas and all kinds of cars where you just have to take measurements and adjust things and you don't need to even need to buy any parts. But the Miata head is a little bit more tricky and that's why I'm making this video to teach you guys how to do it. So let's just jump into it. The only specialty tools you'll need for this job are a feeler gauge and a way to measure the shims. I personally think a micrometer is the most accurate way to measure them and I do not believe a caliper is accurate enough for this job. Now I'll have a link down below to these tools in case you don't have one and if you don't know how to read a micrometer I'll have a video down below on how to do that. It's also essential to have a way of keeping all your data very organized. This is a crucial step in the process because if you don't stay organized, you're not going to get your lash right and you're basically going to have to start over. I just created these charts on Google Sheets and if you want to get yourself a copy, I'll have those down in the description as well. To get your engine ready for the lash measurement, all you have to do is remove the valve cover and put the transmission in neutral. So the first question that pops into your mind probably is what the heck is valve lash? Well, if I zoom in on one of the lobes of the exhaust cam, you can see there's a tiny gap between the cam lobe and the lifter shim. That is the lash. And there's supposed to be a tiny gap there, but it has to be a very exact measurement in order for the engine both to run right and not to do any damage to the valve train. Now, when I turn the engine, you can see the cam lobe comes around and it contacts the shim and it pushes the valve open. If that gap is too big, what happens is the cam lobe with such high speed comes around and it slams into that shim and it opens the valve very harshly. And then when the cam lobe finishes going through its cycle and it's leaving the valve, if the gap is too big, the valve will slam shut and it can even start bouncing and do bad damage to the drivetrain. Now I'll hop over to the intake side where I actually located a problem. If the lash is too tight, or in other words, if the gap is too small, when the cam is done and it's through its cycle, there will be no gap left between the lobe and the shim. And if it goes enough, if it's too tight, it can actually be negative lash where the valve doesn't even close all the way. And I believe that's what's happening here. You can see the cam is not leaving the shim at all. So if you could probably guess, you know, that, that could be a friction issue or a cooling issue and it could actually cause damage to the cam if it's run like that for long enough. And it doesn't let the valve close all the way, which is terrible for trying to make power. So now I'll use my feeler gauge to measure the lash on each valve and note everything down. The intake valves are supposed to be between eight and nine thousandths and the exhaust valves are supposed to be between 12 and 13 thousandths of clearance. To tell the difference between the intake and exhaust valves is easy. The intake valves are on the side with the intake manifold, exhaust valves are on the side with the exhaust manifold. Now can you visually tell the difference in the thickness between these two blades? Probably not. 
But the difference is one is 23% too large and that valve would need to be adjusted. And this is showing just how important it is to be accurate with your measurements. So to measure a valve, all you need to do is use a ratchet to rotate the engine until the pointy end of the cam lobe faces away from the valve. And then I'll start with my 13 thousandths feeler and that goes in pretty easy. So I'll go to 14 thousandths. That goes in pretty easy as well. I can hear everyone in the comments section making that's what she said jokes as we speak. The first gauge that will not go in is the 18 thousandths. So you don't want to force it. It should slip in with just a little bit of resistance. So I'll go back to the 17 thousandths just to confirm and it glides right in there. So this valve is 17 thousandths, which is too large of a gap. So that's one of the valves that I'll need to put a new shim into. Now I'll just repeat that step for all 16 valves and write down the lash measurements. Yeah. Okay, intake valve number seven is my first real problematic valve. Even the 2000s feeler will not slip in between there. So there's no measurement that can be taken on that valve. Uh, the lash is either zero or even worse, it might be negative, which means the intake valve is not even closing all the way. So I'm losing massive compression in that cylinder, which when I did a compression test, that was one of the cylinders that was very low and that is where all the compression is going. It's the same thing with valve number three. I can't even get the tiniest feeler to go in there, which means it has either a zero or a negative lash. And if the lash is actually negative, I'll show you a little trick that doesn't work all the time, but there's a pretty good chance where you'll get a good lash measurement and you'll be able to figure out what size shim you need to buy for that valve. So here are my results. And what I found is almost all the exhaust valves are a little bit too loose. And I'm almost wondering if the machine shop set them up at 16 thousandths, a little, a little bit more tolerance because it's a higher horsepower engine, but I gotta kind of look in, into seeing if that's a concern or not to have them be a tiny bit too loose like that. But the intake valves are what presented a problem. So on cylinder number two, as shown, one of the valves had a zero or negative lash and the other valve was only two thousandths clearance. And on cylinder number four, pretty much the same case, zero lash and five thousandths clearance. And I knew that cylinder number two was misfiring really bad on cold start, so I did a stone cold compression test. And these were the numbers that I got. 140 PSI on the good cylinders and 50 and 70 PSI on the cylinders with a valve issue. So that's telling me that those intake valves that measured out to be zero are probably not closing all the way and bleeding off compression, at least on cold start. Once it warms up, it seems to idle fine and it feels like it's making normal power, but obviously that's an issue. So what's going on with the head and why are those clearances closing up? I don't really know. And the problem might be bigger than just having to reshim the head, but luckily I caught it pretty early and it's gonna be fixed right now by reshimming it. And if those gaps continue to close, then it might be another issue, like a problem with the valve seats on those cylinders or something like that. But like I said, I caught it early. I'm gonna fix it now. And then if it starts misfiring again, or regardless in a few thousand miles, it's real easy to just check it again and see if the issue is starting to creep up. Now you might be asking yourselves, well, if I don't have a 400 horsepower engine, do I really need to check the clearances? Kind of, because there are probably a lot of you out there that have 100,000 miles on the original head, or maybe even 200,000 miles on the original head. And it's not a bad idea to just get in there and check those clearances. All you have to do is pull the valve cover, and a lot of heads, you'd be surprised, do need adjusting. Even if it's just to get an annoying tick to go away, you might be able to prolong the life of your head by reshimming it and having the proper clearances. So the next step is to measure the shims. Now you gotta get in there and remove them first, and I'm gonna try to do this the easiest way possible. I think you can do it without having to re-time the engine, which is what I, how I'm gonna attempt to do it, but even if you do have to completely remove the cams and time the engine again, it's not that big of a deal. It's even possible to do it with those front covers still on. Don't be afraid of timing your engine, you guys. There's still a bunch of people out there that are like, ah, I'm afraid to mess up my timing belt. You guys are subscribed to the Car Passion channel. What are you so scared of? Anyways, let's jump back into this motor. All right, so some people are probably gonna hate on this, but that's fine. You can take your cams out. So what I did here is just zip tie in two spots on each cam gear to lock the timing belt in place. 
and I'm just gonna drop uh, 14 millimeter down to the tensioner. And then we just gotta remember to retension that later. But now you can see we've got a little bit of slack in the timing belt and I'm just gonna loosen up the exhaust cam only. It's gonna let the cam lift up just a little bit and it'll be able to pull all the shims out. And always remember that the cam caps do need to be loosened in stages and in the correct order so you don't bend or break a cam. And that is in a uh, spiral or a reverse spiral from the outside to the inside. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and do that in a couple stages and just gradually loosen that cam because you don't want your valve springs pressing up on one side of the cam because it could get damaging. All right, that actually worked flawlessly and now the cam can lift up enough to get the shims out. Now I'll remind you that you still need to check your engine's timing after you put everything back together because even though the belt is not able to slip on the cam gears due to the zip ties, it is possible that the belt can slip a tooth on the crank gear. Now, of course, when working inside your engine, you need to be exceptionally careful not to get any dirt or debris in there as well as not to scratch any of the surfaces. To get the shim out, you can simply rotate the lifter by hand until you see the little groove and you can very carefully use a small flathead to get the lifter out but i like to be safe you can also stick the end of a trusty old zip tie right it underneath the groove and you can see the lifter is free Let's see if we can just swoop it out of there oh. No, I don't want the lifter. Oh, there it goes. There's your, there's your shim. Let's get these bad boys all out and measured. Now, be extremely careful not to mix these up. You have to keep track of which valve each of the shims comes off of. It's gonna be imperative. Otherwise, might as well just start the whole job over. All right, I've got all the shims out now. I should probably have them in some kind of organizer or container, but I'm just gonna YOLO it and hope that an earthquake doesn't hit. The next thing to do now is measure each one of these, keeping them in order, of course, and figuring out what we're working with. All right, so now I know what all my shim sizes are. The next thing I'll do is write down, in a perfect world, how much does each valve need to be adjusted in order to be perfect? So the ones that are within spec, 0 .008, 0 .008, those are all good to go and do not need to change. However, 0 .002, that really needs at least 0 .006 larger gap to be within spec. And then the ones that measured out to be zero, we have no idea what the change needs to be because we don't have a measurement. You'll understand why I'm doing all this in just a second, so bear with me. Now we can see how much the lash needs to be adjusted on each valve. Now the ones that have a check mark like this, those shims can go back onto the valve that they came off of. However, the ones that need to be adjusted, there's a chance that some of these shims can be switched around on the valves to fix multiple lash issues. So you don't have to order all these shims. You might only need to order a couple. And that's what I created this final column for. So I can take what the current lash and shim is and figure out what size shim needs to go onto that valve to create the correct amount of lash. The only thing we're left with are these question marks because we don't have a measurement for those valves. And what I'm going to try to do, and hopefully it works, is you can see on intake valve number three, that is one of the ones where we have no measurement. It uses a shim that's 0.1267. Now what I'm hoping I can do is take my thinnest shim, which is right here, 0.1224, 
put it onto that lifter and then get some kind of measurement as to where the lash is. Now this part's a little easy to get confused, so make sure you notate it in a way that you understand. You don't necessarily have to do it the way that I'm doing it, but this way it makes sense to me. This first intake valve, which has a lash of five thousandths and a shim of 0.1239, needs the lash to increase by three thousandths which means it needs a thinner shim by three thousandths. So the shim that needs to go in there should be approximately 0 0.1209. And I can already see that's a problem because there are no shims in the whole motor that are that thin. So I'm probably going to have to order at least that one and probably a few more, but I'm gonna do the math on the rest of these and figure it out. All right, now I know the shim that each valve needs in order to have perfect adjustment. Let me see if I can figure out those two question mark valves. All right, so I've taken my two thinnest shims and put them into the mystery valves. And then I've also noted on the sheet which valve each shim went into. So the 1227 shim is now on intake valve number seven and the 1224 is on intake valve number three. All right, I am hoping so hard that there's gonna be a gap in here. And there's no gap. That is highly unfortunate. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I can't really think of a way to determine the lash on that valve other than ordering a super thin shim and then remeasuring it. That sucks, that's kind of concerning that the lash changed by that much from when the motor was new, but I guess we'll just have to see how it goes. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, when you tighten the cam back down, you do need to put a full set of shims on that cam. I don't know if the cam can damage the bucket without a shim in it, but I don't wanna be the first one to find out. So the safest way to do it is just switch around the shims that you need to, and then just put the regular ones back in. So when you tighten the cam down, nothing gets damaged. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys one quick example of being able to switch the shims around. This is a bit of a tedious process, but it, it makes a lot of sense. You just gotta go slow and take your time. So I know that each one of these valves that's not within spec, the shim that's in there is not going to be in there anymore. So those shims are up for grabs. Now I calculated that Exhaust valve number six needs a 0.1264 shim. It's currently got a 0.1224, but that's obviously throwing the valve out of spec, so it's no good. Check out exhaust valve number three. It's got a 0.1267, and it is also out of spec by three thousandths. I can take this 1267, put it on exhaust valve number six, and then that valve will be within spec, and that's one less shim that I have to buy. So I'm gonna try to figure out how many of these shims I can switch around. All right, I know you guys are probably bored by now, but if you're bored watching this video, you're definitely gonna be bored shimming your head. It's boring work, but it needs to be done. All right, so when I first started, I had 11 valves that were out of adjustment. Now, via switching the shims around and through all these calculations, I only have six valves left that are out of adjustment that I do not have the correct size shims for. Two of which, of course, I don't know what size they need. So what I'll do is order the four shim sizes, one, two, three, four, that I know I need, and I'm just gonna kinda order a variety of very thin shims, thinner than my thinnest one that I already tried, and hope one of them is good. I mean, they're not terribly expensive, uh, but that's where it kinda gets complicated again. See, if you go online and just search up Mazda Miata valve shim, you're not really gonna find anything. So, what I've done for you is compile a complete list of Mazda part numbers for all the shims they offer. But those shims are kind of expensive and sometimes they're not available at all, especially in the size you need. So you might be asking, why don't you just measure the diameter of the shim and then search that up? Way ahead of you, my dudes. I've already done that, and the Mazda Miata uses a 27 millimeter valve shim, uh, which is kind of uncommon, and that's unfortunate because if you search for 27 millimeter valve shims, you're not gonna find much, if anything. But it turns out that there are several different engines from different manufacturers that use 27 millimeter valve shims. They're just not labeled under their part numbers. They're just called like valve adjusting shim. They don't list a diameter or a thickness. So what I have for you in the link down below is a complete list of part numbers for Mazda, Nissan, and Toyota shims. So you have a huge range. And speaking of range, 
The Mazda shims are only available in a certain range of thicknesses where the Toyotas and the Nissans actually have other sizes that aren't even offered by Mazda. So now you guys should have what you need to get any size shim that you need. But Craig, what if we buy these Toyota shims and they don't actually work in the motor? How do you know if they're going to work? Fear not, because it is one week later and I have already ordered and received a full set of Toyota shims, which I'm gonna be attempting to install into the Miata engine and making sure they work and firing it up and seeing that it's all good. I wanna be sure that these are good and will work before I actually recommend them to you guys, you know, buying some Toyota shims for your Miata engine. I know people have used the Nissan shims before, so I know they work, but I've never heard of anyone putting the Toyota. These actually come from a 1UZ, which comes out of a Lexus LS400 or Toyota Celsior, uh, but they appear to be the same size, and I think they're going to work fine. So I'm going to put them all in, and uh, we'll go from there. So the first thing I want to do is verify that the Toyota shims are in fact going to work in the Miata engine. So I'm just going to take a random shim here and throw some oil on it and try to drop it into this lifter. And you can see that it's an absolute perfect fit. And that is verification right there. You saw it here first, Toyota 1UZ lifter shims do work in the Miata lifters. So that's confirmed. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is put my thinnest shims into the bad intake valves and get an accurate lash measurement from there and hope that I ordered enough of a variety of these shims in order to properly clearance those valves. All right, let's check intake valve number three with a super thin shim. And I'm gonna use my 9 thousandths feeler see if I miraculously get it right on the first try. Nope, that's definitely far too loose. But the point of putting a thin one in there is just to get a measurement so I can determine what size does need to go in there. All right, so the lash on this valve now with the super thin shim is 24 thousandths. So now that I have a measurement, I can figure out what I need to put in there. So of the five different shims that I guessed on, it looks like two of them are going to be extremely close. They'll get me within one thousandth of an inch clearance, which is perfectly okay. They'll be a thousandth on the loose side and the valves and seats as they wear out, that lash clearance actually gets a little bit tighter over time. So I'm okay being one thousandth loose. I'm going to get this thing shimmed up, get the motor back together, fire it up and hope that it sounds better than it did in the beginning of the video. I was also able to calculate what the negative lash was on the bad intake valves, number three and seven. They had a negative lash of four thousandths and three thousandths, which means instead of fully sealing all the way and letting the combustion happen, those intake valves, one on each cylinder, was staying open by about that much. That's how much space the combustion had to escape through. And that tiny, tiny, tiny gap is what was causing that engine to run like complete garbage at idle. So that shows you how important it is to be precise when you're setting lash. Okay, I gotta show you guys this. I'm measuring up my final clearances right now. You remember how I wrote on all the shims, an E8, E4, signifying which valve they came from? Okay, so I put the shims back in here and I've rotated the cam around and the cam lobes perfectly picked up the letter and the number from each shim. There's E3 and I3 on that back one. Anyways, I just wanted to share that uh, because I think that is just random and kind of cool. And the reasoning behind that is even more interesting. In case you didn't know, as the cam lobe swings around and hits the shim, it actually rotates the lifter in the bucket, so it's not constantly hitting on the same part and wearing it out. And that's why, if you look closely, you can see the center line of the cam lobe is off of the center line of the shim. And it's like that in all engines. So when this cam lobe is tapping the shim, it's constantly rotating it so it doesn't wear the top out. So when that cam lobe swept past the shim, it rotated and it like, like a newspaper print, like picked up the lettering off that shim. Are you entertained or are you completely bored by that? I don't know, I thought that was cool. But anyways, I'm gonna get this thing back together. All right, so the cams are torqued down. 
The timing belt is tensioned. I verified that the cam gear timing marks all line up. There's 19 teeth between the timing marks and most importantly, you gotta make sure that your crank gear timing mark lines up with top dead center. If you need a video on how to do your Miata's timing belt, how to reset your timing, I will link that down below as well. I've also got just a dab of silicone RTV at each side of each cam cap, six dabs in total, and that's to help the valve cover seal up where the cam caps join up with the head. All right, so the engine's back together. The only thing left to do is push it out of the garage and fire it up. And I'm gonna play the two clips back to back before and after the proper lash adjustment. I think the difference is gonna be pretty obvious, but you let me know what you guys think. I know you guys know this feeling. When you first put your car all back together, you did some sort of procedure. You don't know if it's gonna start or not. Let's see how she runs. All right guys, well that's all I got for you on how to reshim your Miata's head. As you can see, the car fired right up and runs much smoother than before. If you guys are doing this procedure yourself, don't forget to check out the link in the description. It's got part numbers, tools, worksheets, everything you could need to do this yourself. Of course, you can always drop a comment down below, shoot me a DM, and I can try to help you with any questions you may have. But yeah, don't forget to hit subscribe if you are new, smash that like button if you did learn something, and I will catch you in the next one. Peace out. Mmm.